All right, I think we'll kick things off. So welcome everyone who has joined. My name is Laurel Broadman. I'm Managing Director of Admissions at the Yale School of Management. I'm also a proud graduate of Yale SOM. So I'm so excited for the opportunity tonight to be back in the classroom with Professor Paul Bracken. Uh, Paul Bracken is a professor of management and political science here at Yale University. He is a respected thought leader in global competition and the strategic application of technology in business and defense. His research and teaching focus on solutions for senior management as it deals with a changing strategic environment and conditions of intense uncertainty. Mm -hmm. He's a leading teacher in exec education and is also a frequent teacher at One Day University on topics such as problem framing in business, the future of the corporation, big business and democracy, and the second nuclear age. Professor Bracken will be speaking with us today about how innovations in defense technology are driving a new arms race among major powers, specifically the United States, China, and Russia. I'm so excited to welcome Professor Bracken here tonight, and I'm going to turn things over. If you have uh, questions along the way, you can send those uh, along behind the scenes, and I'll be vetting them in about halfway through tonight's uh, presentation. We'll pause and we'll take uh, questions for Professor Bracken. Uh, Laurel, thank you very much. Uh, I am really uh, delighted to be here this evening and welcome to everybody who is joining us. Welcome to Yale University. Welcome to, to the School of Management where I've been teaching for many years and um, where I think we have a kind of unique approach that very few other institutions do. And tonight illustrates that because I don't know of any other business or management school in the country that would have a course um, on looking at the national security and international order situation from a management perspective. This is a really important perspective to have. <clears throat> it's my view, and let me just make a couple of introductory comments before I'll flesh this out. The uh, one of the biggest gaps in American leadership today is the difficulties of management, managing technology. So many companies, not just technology companies, but all companies are becoming de facto technology companies. They spend huge amount of money on it. They have to understand how to make investment decisions. They have to understand what leadership means in a very advanced technological context. And by this, we do not mean that you learn how to program in Python or learn the difference between machine and deep learning. Rather, we mean something different. What we try to do at Yale SOM is to get above the technology, if you will. So you can look down on a problem and see the different parts, some of which will be techno technological, but a lot of the, whether the technology works or doesn't work, either technically or in the marketplace, are going to depend on very different issues, such as the political and social context, such as human resource issues, um, such as marketing issues so that people understand it. What I've done in my career is to look at sort of two areas which are very technologically intensive. And one is multinational corporations. And I teach courses on that at SOM. And the other is of course, uh, international defense issues, what we're here to discuss tonight. So why don't I share my screen and we can kind of jump into that. And I'm gonna leave a lot of time for questions. Uh, so, okay, so what you see is a logo, and I'm sure you know that's Huawei's symbol, and it's the United States and China. And what are we looking at tonight? What I'd like to look at tonight is the new technological competition with national security overtones, both directly and indirectly. And we're going to look at this from the point of view of not so much winning a war, which none of us wants, but how would the Pentagon, how would the Chinese Ministry of Defense, the Russian Ministry of Defense, and if you want, we can talk a little bit about India, how would they make investment decisions? What are they doing? How do they direct all of this technology? 
And I think a good way to begin is with a little quote. Okay. That if you were to take courses um, in college today or a lot of graduate schools, particularly in the, well, in political science, social sciences, there's kind of a pushback and they're, they're a little bit angry at technology. And they say, well, you're always exaggerating some the effects of technology. That is to say, you're, you're looking at for technical solutions of which are much more, in fact, complicated problems. And I would make a different point. That today, the United States in particular, but also China, Russia, the West Europeans, East Europeans, are, have a tendency to systematically understate the significance of technology and to neglect it in their studies. And what we need to do is to raise it for what it's worth, acknowledging that a lot of problems are not technological in any way, but you need to understand where the technology fits in. And let me just give an example of the effects of technology. And you can read this, I'm not gonna read you this, this chart. Um, but let me put it this way in a fairly stark presentation, okay. The U.S. won the Cold War because of our military technology, period, okay. Now, we can say ideology mattered, and that's kind of the common, most popular presentation today. But let's look at some facts. The United States over the Cold War of 50 years from, say, 1948 to 1991, roughly 50 years, spent about 7% of its gross domestic product on defense. And the largest size of the US Army at that time was 18 divisions. Go, let's go back to World War I where the US Army had fielded 100 divisions and GDP went to 45% uh, spent on defense. Moscow, Soviet Union spent 25% of its uh, resources on defense, and they had 250 divisions. This was an astounding drag on the Soviet economy, which slowed them down so that they couldn't build a consumer society. They simply didn't have enough wealth in the country. If you were to look at the Cold War experience of the United States, we substituted technology for manpower, and that allowed to, for the domestic economy to be prosperous. I highlight this, this is exactly the sort of insight that we have to understand to see the role of technology. Technology allowed us to win the Cold War in a way which at the same time as the Cold War was being conducted, allowed the United States to raise the standard of living of the American people, okay? This gave us a global prim primacy in not just war, but in business, for 70 years. So the reason today the United States dominates the aerospace industry, admittedly with some competition from our friends at Airbus, but um, in like space communications, telecommunications, it's only when you get to the early 21st century that this primacy wears off as China rises and competes with us. And you know that's the world that we're into today. Think about it, in the Cold War, the United States created the military industrial complex, the aerospace industry, which didn't exist before that, Silicon Valley, <clears throat> with all that it has given us, was created initially with Department of Defense monies invested in startup companies to build better microwave and electronic warfare systems, which over the years spun off and eventually evolved into your into the into the tech companies that we know today and finally people overlook this the modern research university there was no research at american universities before world war ii it was all um research in the humanities but the pharmaceutical industry the technologies that came from washington supporting the harvard yales columbia's princeton stanford to do research, okay? And this research gave us things like the transistor, the integrated circuit, the computer, lasers, satellites, internet, software-defined radios, 
and jet engines. So when I talk about strategy, technology, and war, we're kind of covering a lot of these things here. Um, you can look at this maybe later. Uh, it's just a world changing programs, not only for the United States, but for other countries that dependent on an intelligent use of technology. Okay. Today, what do we see in the world? We see more new technologies coming into the militaries of the world, in particular US and China, than we have at any time since the early 1950s in the Cold War. Okay, we've got drones, stealth, cyber attacks, data analytics. Most of the data, data analytic algorithms were funded 20 years ago by the Dep Department of Defense. Now, the Department of Defense has badly lagged in recent years in this area, but that's the world we're in today. Okay. And again, we have to, if you want to look at the larger implications of my subject, this technical issues interact with political and cultural issues. And we've seen that in the last several elections. So to understand the world today, you really need all of these three things interacting. Um, to understand why the United States is so concerned about falling behind China. Now, China was a, an anomaly because it really had no science and technology base for almost a thousand years. It's, this is a relatively recent phenomenon, and it's actually called the Needham Paradox, why China never developed. This sentence was written in 1969 by Professor Needham, and well, it's laughable today because what he didn't understand was, and no one could understand in 1969, how the Chinese would shoot forward uh, and be so successful on a number of technological frontiers. Okay, <clears throat> let me just sort of look at China in a little bit more detail since that is a challenger for the United States in this technological primacy. And again, going back to 1950, it's for both war and business. Um, China was born into a world that of two superpowers that had nuclear weapons that could have destroyed them, the United States and the Soviet Union. China didn't have any nuclear weapons and was humiliated in a series of crises in the Cold War. Um, and today, China is doubling the size of its nuclear arsenal along with a very large investment program in its other military technologies. But something useful to remember here, like where this is all going, is that um, today and in the future, China is going to be the only country in the world surrounded by five nuclear weapon states. Now, some people will say, well, North Korea and maybe Pakistan, you have to put on Russia's side today. And I would just say, that's a really simplistic way of looking at it. If you're in Russia, the thought of India, Pakistan, North Korea, et cetera, having nuclear weapons surrounding you is a great source of concern. So here's another use of technology, sort of what do we call this, like threat or potential threat. And this provides the United States government leverage to possibly have friendly negotiations with China to alleviate some of the difficulties that would come out of this situation. So if you were to take my course at Yale, which is joint listed in the School of Management and the Political Science Department, what you'd find is that the, it's not, we don't really focus on like who's gonna clobber each other better, but what are the really important strategic consequences of these technologies spreading? And one of them is, China is going to be more threatened in the future, and that has openings for the United States. Okay, let me just uh, skip through here. Let me turn to a couple of technologies because some interesting things going on. There's a uh, artificial intelligence, for example, which has been around literally since the 1950s, and artificial intelligence has lots of military implications and lots of uh, peacetime enterprise uh, implications. Okay. It's a complicated story. It can be used for facial recognition, it's driving 5G technologies. 
it's at the heart. We, I had a class today on a different subject and it's at the heart of the autonomous vehicle movement uh, where we're doing a research project in during in the course, we're playing a business war game about uh, on the future of semiconductors, integrated circuits. And just if you've been in a new car recently, just think how many integrated circuits, how many semiconductors are in there giving you warnings. Not, I'm not talking years from now, I'm talking like now, if you, if you set your car on cruise control and you come too close to a car ahead of you on the turnpike, the AI systems in the uh, uh, Hyundai Elantra will automatically slow you down. Okay, mobile payments system is built here. AI technologies can also be used, okay, for tracking mobile targets like warship and missiles. And that's really a lot of the reason the military in China and the US is interested in them. But here's the thing. Some people believe that China will surpass the United States in these technologies. Other people believe that they have already done that, okay? So we've all heard about TikTok in the news. TikTok is driven by AI algorithms and they're really good. Just look at the explosive growth of TikTok which has forced the US government into this counter reaction, okay? But the point I wanna make here is TikTok is one example of several I could give you where China is not copying American technology, not using intellectual property theft, but rather surpassing the innovation standards of the United States. And this has immense implications in business. The idea that China is like the low wage sweatshop of the world, you don't even hear that that much anymore. But I wanna make a different point. That once artificial intelligence reaches a certain level of development, and an example of this is what we call deep learning, uh, which uses neural net. You will learn about these things if you take the appropriate courses, okay? The, skill set to make it successful in the marketplace changes from scientific research and development in laboratories of the universities and companies. The skill set shifts to implementation, which requires a very large number of lesser trained engineers. And so the argument before the world today that people are making is that if, these, if the contest were between Nobel Prize winners, the US would win this contest. If the contest is between implementation, China is gonna win this contest. It's one of the issues that we uh, discover. Um, let me just point out a couple of other very intrusive uses of these new technologies that we're talking about here. On the left, upper left-hand side, you see a police car and I doubt many people, when you look on the top of it, you're thinking it's lights or a siren. It isn't, it's an automatic license plate reader that almost every police department in the country has now. They drive, you can put one of these by a turnpike and scan like 10,000 plates in an hour. So you can track cars. Think of what would happen if you could integrate that using AI with facial recognition technology, people tracking, um, video camera technology that was smart and could track where people went without, without, around the city. And at the same time, you could track people on their cell phones, okay? What you would have is a picture of a country or a certain, if you wanted, you could narrow it to generals or their staffs and you could really determine some very important intelligence things of what were going, was going on in Moscow, Washington, or Beijing. And the defense departments that we've been talking about here, US, China, Russia, and others, they're pouring billions of dollars into these technologies. So one of the points I made earlier is that the Department of Defense is the mother of all venture capital firms because they will give you money. They don't take 
intellectual property control of, uh, and they don't take seats on the board. I've been doing a fair amount of work in com with company, private equity companies who are in this sector. It's really interesting of what's going on. Um, this is what the Pentagon would call a kill chain to hit moving targets like missile launchers on the right, incoming enemy missiles, airplanes, possibly satellites. One of the big things that's happened in recent years is that countries ever since really the first Gulf War, oh gosh, when was that? Well, 91, 92, they've been moving their missile forces to put them on trucks, special trucks, so that they can't be targeted. Because if you have a missile in a fixed site, it can be targeted and destroyed. Let me, I think I have a picture of this later on. Uh, what the way I put it, the hunt for mobile missiles is getting faster, cheaper, and better. Okay. This is a typical North Korean missile range of it can hit Japan or South Korea. And you'll notice that it's on a specially designed truck. This is what the missile looks like when it takes off. Okay, and so if you can like track these things moving around, you could target them. That means kill them with conventional weapons like the F-35 fighter, uh, like our own missiles, like other special weapons, perhaps a missile on a robot drone that is loitering around, hooked into the command and control system, which tracks these mobile missiles. All right. Um, and destroy them. So this has immense political and strategic consequences, which I think only very small numbers of people in the respective governments are appreciating at the present time. Um, I mentioned before that deep learning is this, what we call a dominant design. Um, this is a key concept in my technology management courses. This uh, means that you train an artificial intelligence program in a certain way that is very successful. And once you have the breakthrough and know how to do deep learning, you can execute in a much more uh, simple way than you could with um, the big blue computer that beat the IBM, that IBM had that beat the world's leader in chess. The significance, I don't know if, any of you in here, a few years ago, they had a computer that could beat the best Go player in the world, the uh, Asian game of Go. And the significance of that was that was the first time they, tried, they tested this new paradigm of deep learning rather than machine learning. Um, we don't want to go into the technical features of this tonight. Uh, but trust me, it's a real breakthrough and it allows you to build a... You, you know what's coming in artificial intelligence. So you can in, increment, in, innovate around different parts of it. Okay, let me mention just one or two more. We have this point, if you go to any business school, you'll come across touch points. Touch points is any time a company uh, touches the customer, for example, with a radio ad, an ad on the internet that the customer sees possibly a television commercial, a downloaded uh, app which advertises the San Francisco Warriors, for example, that is a touch point. These touch points can be integrated, pulled together using artificial intelligence algorithm, and we're moving into a world of what I call high touch reconnaissance. And that means there's, that China, US, Russia, and some others are going to have huge amounts of data, um, which is collected in a stealthy way so that the customer, in quotes, the target, if you will, doesn't know about it. Uh, it's surreptitious. And this is becoming a constant state of affairs in the world. Skip over this and talk about something you probably have heard of, which is cloud computing. Let me talk a little bit about cloud computing as it's playing out into the subject of interest this evening, which is national security. In the olden days, you had organizations and their organizational silos as indicated on the left. And they had huge amounts of data in them, but they didn't share the data 
the red silo didn't share data with the yellow silo, with the blue silo. With cloud computing, you take these different silos, put them into a common platform, put it onto a Cisco database, an Azure database, an Amazon Web Services database. And this allows much greater innovation because all the data is in one location, okay? So we're overcoming bureaucratic social obstacles. The Army doesn't want to communicate or cooperate with the Air Force because they're in a budget fight, just as a simple example. Or the CIA and the FBI don't want to cooperate for reasons of, well, you know, you've worked in bureaucracies, you know how they are. But we're being able to overcome this now with these with cloud computing. It's really an extraordinary advance, not just for efficiency and lowering the cost of IT data centers, but much more importantly, for the agility of the organization and the innovation of the organization to come up with new solutions around complex problems. Okay, um, this is just a few examples of things. If you combine artificial intelligence with the um, cloud computing and data analytics, the data analytics comes in because you need algorithms to sort of take the data from the two different silos and, and smush them together in a way that makes sense for customers, banks to sell you credit cards, or war machines to do automatic target recognition. Um, facial recognition uh, like is a key illustration of this technology. And some of the other things uh, on here, we can talk about these in a, uh, if you want some, you know, have a discussion about these. Okay, let's step back a little bit. And in my own research, one of the things I've done is to look at the databases of the Pentagon. Um, and a very interesting thing has been happening for the past 20 years. And that is the locus of innovation in the United States has shifted. It used to be in universities and in big defense companies or in major government laboratories. Think of the uh, Naval Research Laboratory. Think of Los Alamos National Laboratory. Think of the Air Force Weapons Laboratory at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, okay? They would get funded each year. But after 9-11, for a lot of complex reasons, what happened was that the locust, the really innovative stuff, came out of small and medium-sized companies. And one of the really interesting consequences of 9-11 was that the intelligence community needed a whole set of new technologies to face the terrorism threat, both here and in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so they went to the big defense contractors, the Lockheed Martins, the Northrop Grumman's, General Dynamics, et cetera. And they found out that those big defense contractors were, were so far behind in technology. They had not been doing R&D. So the intelligence community went over their heads and went directly to Silicon Valley and found all kinds of goodies out there that were incredibly useful for hacking cell phones, all right, for facial recognition technology to identify a terrorist. A similar story has been happening in China uh, at the same time. So the locus of innovation has shifted from big companies um, to smaller ones. Now, to update the story in the very recent past, big companies have come back, your Apples, your IBMs, your Amazon Web Services, they've been coming back. So this, I don't mean to say who's right or wrong here, this is just attention and has huge implications if you're a manager, because managing with a, a set of smaller enterprises to get their innovative output is very different from dealing with one large or one or two large defense companies. And there's courses at SOM that will talk about the difference in management styles to appreciate the culture of dealing with a small company with a large one. 
Um, government's been cutting back its R&D and business has been picking up its share of R&D. So we're really seeing a fundamental change in the innovation system of the United States. It isn't just defense by any means. It actually started in the non-defense area, um, but now it's finally percolating into the defense sector. Okay. One of the features of this new innovation system in the United States is that they, it's faster. It is so much faster than a government agency, um, which over the decades, maybe when they were set up in the 50s and 60s of the last century, maybe they were agile, but they've turned into kind of civil service bureaucracies. It's inevitable that this happens. And so by turning to, like they turned to Google for Project Maven, um, this is an artificial intelligence project to put target recognition sensors on, um, on drone aircraft um, that this, they can upgrade the software and increase the performance of the system so much faster than they would if they increase the R&D budgets of like the Naval Re uh, Weapons Lab or something like that. A lot of money is being poured into innovation. The United States has a national AI project. Uh, there's a national commission on AI in defense headed by Eric Schmidt, former you know, prominent technology leader. And we're getting into these new spaces like autonomous vehicles. And what does that mean for the intelligence community? Well, it, it means a lot simply to track certain people. I mean, fully aware that we get into some privacy and sensitivity issues here, but these are, these are immense technological programs. Okay. Um, and the feeling is that China is really good at this stuff, that they're moving from a position of copying US technologies, intellectual property theft, I'm sure you've all heard about that, um, where the expert is king and they didn't have enough experts in China, so they stole our data. And you, this is, in my opinion, true, but it's behind the times a little bit. In China, what's now more important is access to huge amounts of data. And boy, does China have that with their laws that every car built now in China will be trackable. As you know, China has the largest automobile industry in the world, far larger than the United States or Western Europe. Um, if you wanna get into a really interesting discussion uh, or take some interesting courses, look at the future of the global auto industry as China tries to export its cars to the United States and Europe in coming years. That's going to be a big issue. But China is tracking these things and getting an enormous amount of experience which the United States is not tracking. The same thing is happening in the 5G area where a lot of bungling by the United States has led to frequency allocations for the, the spectrum, which have left us sort of in the dust when it comes to 5G. Maybe that's changing now. Okay, so some picking up some big points. The locus of innovation is shifting to SMEs you go to business school, you will learn that that stands for small and medium-sized enterprises, okay? Um, there's new patterns of innovation. There's innovations in services and processes. One of the things I have done is to take the Navy leadership down to Disney World to look at how Disney's processes are just so good. You don't wait in line very long down there. You get walk, you drive into the parking lot, in the two minutes, they scan your ticket and you're inside the park to see how the Navy could use these process innovations, which they haven't really thought of at all. So we had the admirals go around and sort of see these things, these bracelets I'm sure you've seen at Disneyland and Disney World. Um, and another point I'd like to make about this shift to the small and medium-sized enterprises is that the United States has built something, and I suspect a lot of people in this call tonight have been to Northern Virginia. What you're looking at, I think, is Crystal City, which is where Amazon's regional headquarters is going to be. Um, and the United States 
has built what can only be called a second Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley in, uh, in San Francisco, what do they specialize in? Mainly consumer electronics work for big companies. This Silicon Valley is a Silicon Valley of defense. And if you're a Pentagon manager or a CIA manager, this changes your world, okay? Because you're no longer working through government bureaucracies. You have to figure out how to use this world optimally just as much as any large corporation has to use, has, has had its innovation system change. It can't just look at its competitors, okay? All right. Let me just conclude tonight in my formal pr presentation with what it's like teaching technology leadership. Because I view my courses at SOM as teaching the next generation of technology leaders. That is those who can make decisions about the longer range consequences of the technology and which technologies to invest in. So we're standing above the level of Python programming, JavaScript, uh, and laser sensors on automobiles. And a couple of things I've noticed I'll leave you with tonight. In almost in every industry, the technology comes first if people don't know how to use it and there's a strategy lag. That's not bad from your point of view. That should smell opportunity. Figuring out a strategy for using all the technology these engineers give us is is a really critical need for the world and the US. We need a higher level language, both in government and business to get above the technology to talk about its consequences and what it means. And I gave some examples tonight with like China's entering these technologies, but let's see what the world looks like if they're really going to be beneficial to, tech, uh, to China across the board. Technology packages. How does one, two, three, or four technologies work together? Just think of Uber or Lyft for a moment. And you've taken very different software technologies, a GPS system, a payment system, the cell phone grid that communicates things. And the brilliance of uh, ride sharing is that they clued all of these three completely different networks together. And so I try to get my students to think in terms of technology packages. And the final two items are uh, simply to, there's whole new skill sets, great fields for you to go into, process innovation, value change, design thinking that could reshape these technology investments. And there's a ton of business experience out there that almost nobody has harvested to look at their national security implications from the companies listed there. So that'll give you a feel for what I do and what I teach at Yale SOM and at Yale University more broadly. And what we'd like to do now is to see if you have any questions or want to take the discussion in any particular direction. Laurel? Thanks so much, Professor Bracken. You gave us a lot to chew on there. We have a lot of good questions coming in. So I will get started. Um, obviously, you talk quite a bit about some of the differences in the ways that this technology has developed in the U.S. versus China. A couple of questions around whether you see any potential collaboration between um, the, those two countries in AI technology development. Yeah, the question of collaboration is, is critical. And for many years, multinationals coming from the U.S. and Europe would go over to China and put research and development centers in China. Let me just give, like GE did this, Siemens did this. The example I wanna give is IBM, which there's a technology called Smart Grid, which is a very interesting technology where it's the software that operates power grids. And IBM decided not to do the R&D for that in the United States because they wanted to sell it globally. And in order to do so, they wanted to, as they put it, go out into the wild west to learn how the developing world, how business is conducted in China so they could learn how business was conducted in South America, in Africa, in South Asia. Okay. Now, what happened was a branch point was hit in which the US and China got into a big trade fight and were cutting off 
the sale of advanced technology to China. So right now we're at a very low point. But I agree with the thrust of the question. There is a lot to cooperate on in under more normal circumstances, perhaps in the next four or more years, I think you could see a return, well, to a more balanced approach where it's no longer, let's keep Chinese technology out of the United States, but rather let's cooperate so the US and China can share technologies um, and advance the interests of both peoples. So I definitely see that coming. Um, another question, uh, today's focus has largely been on countries, the, uh, the questioner considers high income countries. They're interested in whether or not you see low or middle income countries being competitive in this new arms race. Um, I don't see them being competitive in the arms race other than that they can be supplied with technologies which increase their security. It's funny, we had a, I had a, we're doing a business war game in a class I'm teaching today. And one of the teams is Costa Rica. And Costa Rica solved this problem by abolishing their army, I think in 1950 or something like that. But what, what is happening in the world today, and this gets into admittedly a sensitive area, is that many countries want to buy these surveillance technologies so that they can monitor their own population. And the record of this isn't very good, that in Africa and South America, when they buy these technologies, they use them for one political group to exclude another political group from the political process. But the way this is framed in Washington, in Beijing is, look, we can't send US soldiers all over the world. We can sell them some of these technologies so they can uh, control terrorists and they may be misused. And we have sold them these technologies, the United States has. Uh, China will sell any of these surveillance technologies. One of the reasons to develop them is to sell them to the various authoritarian regimes that are around the world. It's, as I said, it's a very sensitive issue, but it's one that, you know, if you come to Yale for an education, we're not here to tell you, paint a picture of how the world should be in the best of all circumstances, but also to tell you how the world is. It's a good segue to a few of the other questions which touched upon the, the ethics of these technologies. So um, I'll take one of them that sums up a few of the others. How do you think we can maintain and enforce high ethical standards when developing the technologies you're discussing? And do you see countries developing different standards? I think the answer there <laughs> you've already given to some extent. Well, yeah, the, the, what's the world is sadly, in a way, uh, fragmenting into different segments uh, where there's a China Asian set of technologies and internet and privacy rules, which are very different from those which exist in Europe and the United States. Um, and I mean, this has really large business implications because if you're in the integrated circuit business, you would like to make an integrated circuit you can sell anywhere in the world because you can have scale economies in your fabrication plants. So this is a very ominous trend. It may be an ominous trend for political reasons as well. Um, as to how we can maintain high ethical standards. I think keeping the issue before the public at all time, we have several foundations and think tanks which do that. Um, the United States is not guilt free in this area. Um, Lord knows we are selling the weapons to uh, the United Arab Emirates and others for bombing Yemen today. Uh, but I personally feel that the United States is among the most ethical of countries here when I look at it in a relative sense compared to other countries. Um, and these are all big issues that need to be debated. Um, simply declaring that we will not do this just 
gives the markets to China, uh, which in its own way prevents altogether new problems. Good. And expanding on, on that, and maybe a point you made earlier in, in the presentation, but can go perhaps a little bit deeper on how do cultural and philosophical differences between um, between the countries you've been discussing and other sort of um, emerging powers in this area affect how their businesses develop AI? There, the cultural and historical differences are immense and are uh, they're striking and they're going to be more important. One of the things going on now in the world is that China's, I mean, when I started teaching at, at, at Yale, I would ask comp my students, name a Chinese company. Okay. Um, and the only company that they could name was the beer. What is it? Uh, the Chinese beer. All right. So Chinese companies built their skills and their markets on the immense Chinese market, the most populated country in the world. Made a lot of sense for them to do that. Japan did not do that. South Korea did not do that. South Korea was too small. Japan in the 1960s and 70s and 80s built to a global scale by exporting to the United States. China did not do that. China is starting to do that today. And so they would like to enter the mobile payments business, mobile telecommunications. They have probably pushed 5G technologies you've all heard about more in this direction than any other, but they would like to go into pharmaceuticals, aerospace. And so there's like huge pushback against these things. 40% of BMWs in the world are sold in China. And China is requesting access to the German automobile market and has been denied that. Uh, very interesting political business dynamic. So can this continue? Well, if China shuts down BMW in China, they're produced in China, the BMWs that are sold there. Like BMW is, is up a crick, let's put it that way. 40% of their sales are gonna be gone, okay? So, there's got to be some resolution of this. And the whole skill sets needed by leaders of multinational corporations are changing because of the issues we're discussing. Just think of, of uh, Mark Zuckerberg having to fly to Paris to testify before the French legislature, to testify in London, to testify in Washington, DC the public relations aspects of these, all of the cultural issues, they're so different. How do you build a staff system that can support a leader in this much more fragmented world, if you will? Um, well, we don't know the answers to that, but again, at your age, I would say these problems are opportunities, great fields to go into. Um, question about space, and as, as someone who grew up at the tail end of the first Cold War, I guess this one tickles me, what role will space play in the next generation of defense as many information technologies rely on satellites? Um, will satellites be the next flags to defend? Yes, yeah, space is getting uh, so much more important because that's where all the, a lot of the data flows. And specifically in national security, as you know, China has tested what we call ASATs, A-S-A-T. These are anti-satellite weapons. One of the big weapons that you don't, even if you're like into national security issues or a veteran or something, you don't really read about, but it's really uh, the next big thing is laser anti-satellite weapons. These are weapons on the ground that can fire a high energy laser to dazzle, they call it, blind a satellite. Now, what? why would somebody do this? Uh, a couple of reasons they might do it. If the Chinese thought that the US was tracking North Korean mobile missiles with nuclear warheads on them, dazzling our satellites 
would break up our ability to track those missiles. All right. Now, the dazzling doesn't destroy the satellite. It just blinds it for a certain period of time. So it's not like a huge escalation. Okay. Another way space is becoming uh, more important um, is good people are talking, talking about putting actual weapons in space. So far, that has not happened. Uh, but there's a great deal of concern that a country like North Korea, uh, and I don't mean to overly alarm people, but that they might put a nuclear weapon in orbit. And that way they could simply, it could just simply rotate being disguised as a satellite. They would hit a button and it would come down on a US target. Um, so in many respects, the world's getting more dangerous because of space. And in many ways that nuclear deterrence is moving to space, exemplified by this ability to track nuclear weapons. The other thing that is, is that the US, is that China can track US warships in the Western Pacific, our aircraft carriers. And they do this through space sensors, which track big pieces of metal, which is what an aircraft carrier is. They use other technologies as well. As well. But the US may be, uh, in certain circumstances, feel that it has to disrupt this kill chain, if you will. So these are really complex interesting issues. And sometimes I feel like it must be like going back to 1949 when nuclear weapons had just come in, jet aircraft had just come in, people were talking about satellites. Like, how do you make sense of all of the things going on at the present time? It's really a lot of, uh, a very interesting challenge. Goodness, Professor Bracken, like we don't have enough to worry about already. <laughs> On, uh, on that note, what are your thoughts on using AI to track and mitigate future pandemics or diseases? AI will be a key technology in handling this pandemic. It already has proven its worth by going through the immense data sets related to COVID for designing a vaccine. Uh, I was just reading about this. Um, you can track people um, to see if you have COVID, who you have come near physically, okay? And then you can inform those people. Now, to do all of this, you need a massive intrusion into the privacy of Americans, okay? And it seems to me that Americans, not all of them by any means, but most Americans um, have signaled a willingness to let this happen. Now this could change, okay? Uh, in which case we'd be in a different, if there was huge pushback against these things. So what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is to factor in social forecasting, the behavior of the American public to intrusion, which looks to be for pandemic, control reasons, all right? If the government violates that trust, it could collapse the whole thing and Congress could pass laws preventing it. This is why our leaders need an education in politics, politics with a small p, not Republican and Democrat, but they need political skills to read their environment because that political environment is so decisive on the technologies. You're seeing that when you read the papers today, I use this old expression reading the papers. And when you read the web, that it's, it's like, it's, the ball is up in the air about the crackdown on your Apples, Googles, uh, and Amazons, that they become such a part of American life. And it's really interesting to think of their strategies which I would say at the moment are trying to damage limit the new controls that Congress, the next Congress might put on these technology companies. Um, and I showed a picture earlier of Bristol City. In my other courses at SOM, one of the pictures I invariably show is K Street, 
K Street is that street in Washington, DC, which tends to be the locus of the lobbyists, the think tanks, uh, in quotes, these are think tanks often supported by corporations, different research centers, which are really fronts for different trade groups like HMOs. And K Street has grown explosively. So if you go into a restaurant on K Street, you better have a pretty good expense account because that's where lobbyists take um, congressmen, congressional staffers, et cetera. And you know what you're like, I was in, I've been going to Brussels recently, the headquarters of the European Union, at least the business side of it. And it's beginning to look like K Street, which is to say overpriced restaurants, lobbying organizations, trade groups, all trying to influence legislation. Now, you may call think that of this as narrow public relations. It isn't. These are care, these, these public affairs strategies are carefully woven by the leadership of our great corporations, carefully woven into a larger fabric which involves technology, um, human resources, borrowing money, finance, and capital to put together a really integrated strategy at the top of the company. Um, and Yale trains leaders in how to do that um, for better or worse. I'm going to try to squeeze one more question in here. We're coming up against time, but there's so many good ones that are coming through. So let's, let's end on this one. Um, regarding your advice that CEOs often undervalue technology, do you believe that organizations are presently skilled enough at advising non-technical executives on major tech initiatives, or is there still competency that needs to be built there? And I guess if it's the latter, how do we build that? I think non-technical executives need to bone up, and you have to know something about the technologies. If, if you don't know what Python is, then you're gonna miss some of this thing, but it's a computer language. But I think the more important issue is to recognize the gap that exists, that somebody who is and can develop these technology skills can move more rapidly up in a corporation. And I'll just end on giving some, a little advice I give to my students at Yale, which is the importance of staff work when you graduate from Yale or wherever, you know, great schools that you wind up going, you're not going to be the head of Accenture. You're not going to be the head of Morgan Stanley. You're going to have a job there. And how do you advance quickly? By learning as much as you can. And you do that through your work on staffing committees, on task forces, committees, whatever they call it. And try to be as creative as possible and to use those as a learning platform for how the whole thing, the whole corporation operates. Uh, we just go through some exercises on how to do this in my problem framing course, uh, but maybe we'll save that for the next, uh, the next talk. Great, thank you so much. And thank you for giving everyone participating today a chance to get a glimpse of what it's like to sit in a Yale SOM classroom. I appreciate your time so much. Um, thank you so much for everyone who's joined us today. I am going to just um, point your attention towards a couple of other events we have coming up in the in the coming days and weeks. So this week is actually a busy one. We've got a Inside the Yale SOM Experience panel this Wednesday with some of our current students answering questions about their experience at SOM. We have an alumni of color perspectives um, panel on Thursday another alumni, online alumni panel on Friday. And then if you enjoyed today's master's class, which I'm sure you did, we have another one of those coming up in early December on the 4th. It's called uh, Evidence-Based Entrepreneurship and it's with Professor uh, Kyle Jensen. And then um, moving a little bit away from this, but into the application process, we have our online application uh, tips panel on Thursday, December 10th. All of this information um, can be found under the events section of our website. So we hope that you'll join us um, for some of those events that we have coming up. So thank you once again, Professor Bracken, and thank you everyone for joining us today um, and have a good rest of your day or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Thanks a lot. All right, bye-bye.